earth. And I was studying the book of Acts, and you get to the end of the first chapter of Acts, and you find that the church had come together, and they started praying. And they started seeking the Lord. And they started getting into a place of unity. They got into a place where they were in one accord. And God says, the heavens broke open and a mighty rushing wind got into that. What if God is bringing prayer back, but not the way we used to it? What if God is creating a new song in the church right now and he's wanting to put it in the mouth of every saint so that we together in one accord can pray down the move of God from heaven that he's wanting to declare. And I had to repent at that moment because there'd been some songs that I'd been dismissing as not being worship songs. And why should we sing that song in church? And as I was thinking on those songs yesterday, and I, and I started thinking about the words, my heart started breaking. And I thought, God, that is beautiful. Because I started looking at it as a prayer and not as a song. We find these guys... In an upper room, power of God falls on the place. And those who were not inside looked upon them and said, these guys are drunk. These guys, they, they, they're drunk. They've lost it. If I had to start preaching right now in Russian or Japanese or Portuguese or who knows what other language... I don't think many of you would think I'm crazy. I don't think any of you would think I'm drunk. You would think that's amazing. Amen. And yet these people thought they're drunk. Yeah. I was telling in the first service that about, I think it was 2001, my wife and I and a team from our old church, we went to uh, Ukraine and we did a healing crusade in Ukraine and uh, God did some amazing stuff. We saw creative miracles. Probably I've never seen anything like what we saw on that trip. But on, on the last night, as I got to the end of the service and doing the altar call and, and prophesying and ministering, I just, just felt my English change and I was starting to speak in tongues. Well, that's what I thought I was doing. And so the whole altar call and the whole time through, I was ministering and what I thought was tongues and praying for people and power of God moved. And afterwards, people came to me and said, we didn't know you could speak Russian. <laughs> so... I'm not an unbeliever when it comes to what happened on that day on Pentecost because I still don't believe that it happened, but I had too many people tell me we understood every single word you had spoken on that day. But here's the thing. Every move of God that I've been in has raised a bunch of critics who said, no, that can't be right. You know why that happens? Because when a move of God comes, the powers that want to stay the same understand that they've been put on notice. God will not let things stand that he wants to change. Amen. Amen. And so we find, we find ourselves in a story that's so significant and so powerful uh, that the birth of who we are today in Christ happened and Peter and his friends go out and they start preaching. And I, I just thought the other day, I thought, what, how long has it been since you were so overtaken by God that people thought you were drunk? Come on, I know some of you have had this happen in your life before. I know some of you have been in that place with God before, but my question is not, has it happened to you before? My question is, how long has it been? Since you've been in God's presence in such a way that it literally affected you to the point where people wanted to know if you were sober. How long has it been since you have been into a, in a place with God where the joy of God so welled up within you that you couldn't contain what is in you? You just wanted to just do it all. How long has it been since you looked upon the cross of Jesus Christ and you recognized where you came from 
and you think about what has happened in your life and where you could have been and what God has saved you from and, 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 and what He had done to bring you out of that place and, and you recognize what could have been and where you would have been and, and, and the, 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 the gratefulness and the appreciation of the cross so wells up within you that literal tears start rolling down your cheek because of His goodness and His grace and His mercy towards you. How long has it been since we have looked upon Him in such a way that the appreciation of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ becomes fresh? I want to talk to you about the posture of a believer. His kingdom come. You know, there's something that happens in a born-again believer that when you recognize who God is and what He has done for you, that true, honest devotion and appreciation just breaks out in your spirit where the adoration of God cannot but bring you to your knees because you recognize that He is the all-sufficient one, the holy one, the, the creator. He's the El Shaddai, my God, my provider. Without Him, how long has it been? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so we find in chapter 2, yeah, we find uh, Peter reminding us of the words of the prophet Joel. And, and, and this is what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. And chapter 2, chapter 2, <laughs> hallelujah. Oh, this is not on. That'll help. Praise the Lord for technology. Hallelujah. Verse 17, you all with me? You love me? You love the Lord? Yes. Oh, so we're in the right place. Hallelujah. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. You know what I said? It's so amazing. We're seeing our young people prophesying. We're seeing our young people stepping out in boldness and courage and stepping out in things of God. And it's so exciting. But look what we also have. Your old men shall dream dreams. Thank God that we still have old men who dream dreams that are much bigger than they are. And on my men servant and on my maid servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Something spectacular, my friends, is breaking out in the world today. Something spectacular is starting to happen in the heavens and on the earth. There's something that God is releasing in our world today that if you would, as we heard the word this morning, if you would recognize that open door of opportunity, if you would recognize that God is setting before us an opportunity to step into the supernatural, I'm telling you, my friends, it's happening. We see the sun getting darker and we see the earth in trouble. We see the trouble all around us. We see the problems and the issues. But I want to say to you today, God is still God and He's getting ready to move on this earth like never before. And if you will trust Him today, if you will take that leap of faith, if you will step into Him today, He's going to reveal something about Himself that He has been wanting to show you as a child for a long time. The sun shall be turned dark and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever, 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 who's whoever? It's all of us and everybody. Whoever calls, there's an, there's an action that requires us. It's not just everybody will be saved. It is whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Is there, a, is there a calling in your life today? Is there a place in your life today where you're looking to Him and calling Him the Lord of your life? Because whoever calls on Him shall be saved. Now the reality of that is we weren't all born None of us, actually, was born saints. 
We weren't born saints. We became saints when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We became saints when we accepted His forgiveness over our life. And there's only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. There's only one way to enter into all that God has for Him to be our Father and that's for Jesus to be our brother. And God in His great mercy and grace has provided the only means for turning a sinner into a saint and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. I love what it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 2. It says, sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All who call on the name. I love it that, yeah, I just love it. Amen. But here's the revelation. I, I think sometimes we, 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 there's so many concepts in Scripture, and this is the revelation for you about being saved. Here's the thing is when we became the sons and daughters of God, we also became citizens of the commonwealth of God. We became part of the kingdom of God. We are subjects of the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. You accept that to be true? So when we see the word shall be saved, we have to think of those words as well in a kingdom concept. If God is your God, you will bow to him. If God is not your God, you will not bow to him. If God is your king, you will honor him. If God is not your king, you will not honor him. In ancient times, this is how, yeah, let, me, let me just stop there. Jesus said we should pray, your kingdom come. Because this is a kingdom concept that God is the king. And if God's the king, his kingdom shall reign. Okay? So in ancient times, what would happen is when a king came in, and even today, but not in the same way. In ancient times, when a king would come in, all of the subjects of that king would bow down. And if you were a subject of the king, whether you were born in the kingdom or whether you became part of the kingdom, by bowing down, you acknowledged him as king. If anybody in that room or in that place did not bow down, they would say these words, before, bow before your king and be saved. Bow before your king and and be saved. So effectively, part of what is being said here is if, that we are, if we honestly acknowledge God as our King and our Lord, that when we come into His presence, there will always be a place of bowing down before the Lord in our hearts, humbling yourselves. That's what worship really is. Worship is humbling yourself before the Lord and giving yourself completely unto Him. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, all flesh, all flesh. That means God wants everyone to be saved. The reality for us is that with all of that, it doesn't matter what your pedigree is. It doesn't matter what your title is. This is not a word just for a selected few. This is not a word for the pastor or for the deacons or for the elders or for whoever else. This is a word for all flesh. If you are flesh, bite yourselves. Flesh, that's you. This word is for all of us. But still, the reality of that is that not all, not everyone will be part of what God's releasing. And that's what we struggle with. But it's the same as salvation. Salvation is available to all, but you have to receive it. Access is available, but you have to take a hold of what you've been given. Amen? If I said to you, I have a, a nice, beautiful car that you can have, Unless you come and claim it, it's not yours. So this is what we find in the scripture. It says, and on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit. I'm preaching today to the subjects of the most high God, Amen. the king of kings. I'm not preaching to anybody that's from another kingdom because this word is only for the children of God, those who have accepted him as their king and their Lord. If this is so, there's two things that will be evident in your life. There will be submission to God in all things. God will be God in all things. There will be a hunger and a passion for God in all things. Matthew 6, 33, the words of Jesus, seek first 
The kingdom of God. Amen. Seek first what? The kingdom of God. Who's head of a kingdom? A king. He's talking about a king. Let God rule over your life. Let him be God of all. Then we will see signs, wonders, and mighty deeds flow through our lives. Mark 16, 17 says that signs and wonders follow them that believe. It is normal and natural for a child of God, a believer, to, to function and to flow in signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. I was expecting a much bigger amen. amen. All will prophesy. Every single one of you, everyone who calls on the Lord should be able to prophesy. Why? Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And when you open your mouth, you are speaking words of life because every word you speak will come to pass. Amen. That's prophetic, isn't it? What are you saying at the moment? I hope you're saying things that bring life and hope. But that's one of the reasons why I think God's been impressing on my heart since the beginning of the year that he, the, this coming move, this, this thing that he's, he's bringing about right now is going to come through worship. I believe it's going to come through worship. And, and God's been showing me that he wants to show a stronger, more tangible uh, presence in our worship. He, he wants to... Move sovereign, sovereignly in the area of healing. This, we started seeing this when we were in South Africa in September. We, God would just, I would just be doing services and God would just bring us to a place where all we do is worship. And in the midst of worship, healing, people were just being healed without anybody touching them, without anybody praying for them, without anybody putting hands on them. They were just getting healed in the place of just bowing down before the king and worshiping him. And God's been saying to me, that's what I'm bringing to the church. I'm releasing a power of my presence that if you will lift me up, if you will honor me, if you will worship me, I will touch you sovereignly. It's not just the suddenlies of God. It's the move, the power, the presence of God that fills the place. Why worship? Have you thought about that? Because worship is not selfish. Why would God use worship? Because worship is not selfish. You cannot worship and be selfish. You cannot worship and be full of pride. You cannot bow down and stand up at the same time. You cannot acknowledge your self-righteousness when you're on your knees worshiping God. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they will be filled. Psalm 22, 3, God inhabits the praises of his pe people. So here's the thing, though. Worship is not about singing. We've made it about singing because we try and structure church in a building with four walls. So everything, and you've got seats. Everybody sits this way. And, and if somebody's got to stand in the front and talk. And we've got a band. We've structured church to look like this. But worship is not about singing. Worship is about God. Worship is about filling your mouth and your heart and your life with praise and honor and glory and lifting Him up. Worship is not about singing. You can have the worst voice under the sun. But if you're speaking adoration and devotion and love to God, that is worship. God doesn't care whether you can keep a tune or don't keep a tune. God doesn't care how loud or how soft you are. God just cares that your heart, the posture of your heart is broken before Him and that you cry out, I love you, I love you with all of my heart. That's what God's looking for. Amen. We criticize songs and this song and that song and the other thing and this band and that band and this worship leader and that worship leader. Now, did you see what the worship leader was wearing on Sunday? Who cares? It's not about that. It's about a posture of a believer that says, I have come to worship my God and I'm not leaving this place until I encounter Him. Yes. Amen. Adoration. You know what happens? We give God our heart. We give Him our heart and the scripture tells us His throne comes down. We give Him our heart. His throne comes down. King of kings becomes king over your life. His government becomes the government over your life. His majesty declares the majesty 
and glory that will, will stand and what will not stand in your life. Here's the thing. Is the, the psalmist knew this. The psalmist told us that if we worship God, that his literal throne room settles in our life. We enthrone him with our praises. This is maybe why some of us are struggling with adoration in worship. This is maybe why, why we struggle sometimes with humility and with devotion and with faith because we forget that worship is about presenting yourself unto God as a living sacrifice. Worship is about saying, I give myself as an offering to my God. I have nothing else to offer, but I give what I have. said in the first service, it's, it's quite funny. Um, I've been talking to a lot of our young people around, and, and, and I love the heart of young people. I mean, some of you are here, but not, not the ones I'm referring to, but some of you are here. I want to be a missionary in Africa. I want to go to Africa, and I want to live in the jungle, and I want to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to go to India, and I want to live in India, and I want to preach to God. I don't care if they throw arrows at me. I'm going to be a mighty missionary for God. How about falling to your knees and starting by worshiping God? Why about picking up a cloth and starting to wash some feet in the name of Jesus Christ? You know, and this is what I, what I believe we often miss. We want to do the big things for God. But why don't we start with the little things? Yes, fill your mouth with praise. Start there. Start there. If you can fill your mouth with praise, if you can start to declare his holiness with your mouth, isn't that the smallest thing you can do? Before we want to change the world for Jesus Christ, let's fall at his feet and be the servants that he called us to. On my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit, says the Lord all flesh I put this on Twitter this morning what good is good theology if there's no evidence of a living spirit of God living in you I mean we can have all the best theology in the world but Acts 2 that's what it's about what, what good is it you know everything about God but you're not living in the power that he has released on that day why, why did Pentecost come if it didn't come for that amen God said, I will show wonders in the heaven, in heaven above and signs in the earth, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. I will, I will, God will. A, a move of God is all God and it's none of us. It is all God and it's none of us. But we have to let God move. You recognize that point? It's like a tap. I can close a tap and I can open a tap. I can let the water out or I can close. You know how powerful water is? It can destroy a whole house. You, you, you let a damn wall break, it'll destroy a, a, a whole town. Water is really powerful. Have you ever thought that you have a whole reservoir of water in a dam somewhere that's at your disposal and at your leisure you can open the tap and close the tap? Open the tap. Close the tap. Jesus gave us the keys of his daddy's house Amen. to bind and to loose, yes. to release and to hold back. Amen. We have the authority to open the tap, close the tap. I spoke last week about the fact that God doesn't have a plan B because we are the connecting point between heaven and earth. The Spirit of God flows through us, moves through us. God will do it. But we need to know, first of all, that he wants to do it. And secondly, push through and allow his presence to leak out, to flow out of our lives. Hebrews 11.6, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. James 4.8, draw near to God and he will draw near unto you. God will do it, but you need to make him your main pursuit so that everything that is of him will just flow through your life. I believe that is where we're at right now with the church. Not just our church, the church. God is saying, open the taps 
and let me do what needs to happen in this world. I want to transform this world. I want to transform it. The devil has had too much. Too much opportunity to steal our children, to plunder our wealth, to break down our cities, to to tear down everything that is right and that is strong and that is good. Turn open the tap and let me flow. Matthew, I love this, Matthew 10, 8. I love a lot of stuff about this message, so probably why I'm preaching it. (laughs) This is exactly as it is in Scripture. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Why do we not read it that way? I'll tell you how we read it sometimes. We read it like this. Uh, Go to prayer, pray for a week. Go to the pastor and ask him if it's okay. Then bring an offering on Sunday, make sure it's a good one. And then if they want you to come and pray for them, then let them. And, 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 and. And so we put all of this stuff into this very simple scripture. This doesn't say pray so you can heal the sick. This doesn't say pray so you can cleanse the lepers. This doesn't say spend five days in worship so that you can cleanse the lepers. This is pretty simple. It says heal the sick. Is that too simple for us? It speaks about who we are. It speaks about who we are. We, who we are ordained to be. That we have the authority to speak health and healing over the sick. Not beg God and hope that he will show up, but to declare a word of faith and to speak health and healing into people's lives. You know in the old, the old how, they, how, how, how they use different ways to picture things? You know leprosy? Uh, the symbol for leprosy is sin because it eats away at you until there's nothing left. Cleanse the lepers. Find those who have sin in their life and speak words of life and forgiveness over them. Forget their past. Shared a good story with me before the service, Alana. Forget their past. It's not about their past. It's about speaking a new season of Jesus Christ in their life. Now, we want to dissect their history. How many times did they sin? What are they? Oh, they did that. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, well, maybe we'll have to send them to counseling for six weeks. And then maybe once they've done counseling, they repent of their sin. No, 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 no. That's not what that says. Have you spoken a word to cleanse the lepers? The one that I think we need to do quite a bit at the moment is raise the dead. Because some of them attend church. But we're not, we're not to beg God to raise the dead. We are called to raise the dead, to speak life. As you speak life, dead no longer exists. I, I, you know, years ago, I was, uh, we were involved building a church in, in Maputo, which is a, a city in Mozambique. And uh, I was up on the rafters. We, it's a big building, and we were right at the top. And a bunch of, of ladies come running to us. I said, Pastor, Pastor. I said, what is it? My brother's just died. Would you come and pray for him? I said, I'm happy to come and pray, little faith I have, but he's dead. She said, no, until you've prayed, we won't know if he's dead. What about that kind of faith? When last did you phone the elders before you phone the ambulance? There's an idea. All the elders say, oh, delete my phone number. (laughs) Cast out demons. We're not meant to spend hours and hours wrestling with a demon. Jesus never did that. Jesus just said, get out of here, you filthy, horrible thing. In Jesus' name, right now. 
Somebody called a, a couple of months ago and wanted to book an hour with me so that we can sit in my office so we can help, I can help them deliver a demon. I said, why an hour? It'll only take five minutes, if that long. Because it's not what it's about. It's not about who I am. It's not about how hard I try and how many scriptures I know. It's who I am in Christ. It's Him that does it. Speak a word of life. Speak a word of Jesus Christ. And so this is where I'm finishing this service today. If you're in this place today and there is sickness in your life, if you're in this place today and there's sin in your life, if, there's, if you're in this place and there's deadness in your life, no matter what it looks like, even today, if demons and devils have been plaguing your life, we're going to do a very simple thing. We're going to stand to our feet and say, in the name of Jesus. And we're not going to doubt we're not going to remind ourselves about how long this devil or demon or sickness have been around. We're going to declare the word of the Lord and we're going to walk in the fullness of who we are in Christ. Because here's the problem. Unless we learn to do it for ourselves, how are we going to reach the city? How are you going to speak to the sick in the city if you can't even speak to yourself? How are you going to speak to the lepers, the sinners in the world if you cannot even speak to yourself? How are you going to raise the dead that you don't know if there are dead things in your life right now that you haven't even spoken words of life to? Now, I don't believe dem devils and demons can possess those who are full of Christ, but they certainly can torment you like crazy. It's time to tell them to go in Jesus' name.